Mr. President. Senator for Oklahoma. Mr. President, I'd like to just tell you a couple stories. We will talk a little bit about what's happening in health care right now. There's the health care that's happening here in this room, in the debate that's ongoing that started months ago, continues to try to figure out the solutions to what we face in the Affordable Care Act. And then there's the health care issues happening at home. Sometimes we get caught up in this conversation and think this is what the center of the health care conversation is. It's not. The center of the health care conversation in America is around dinner tables. And let me tell you what that conversation sounds like. This comes from one of my constituents that wrote me, that just wrote me. He wrote me, he said, my premium increases from $1,308 per month to $2,489 per month. This is for just my wife and I. We're self-employed, small business owners, and simply cannot afford to pay nearly $30,000 per year for health insurance. We'll have to pay the penalty for not having health care but we have to eat and pay our bills. Sadly, we're both in our late 50s, and we probably need health care more now than ever. Mr. Langford, this is not the America that I grew up in, the America my father fought to preserve in World War II. That's the health care debate happening in America right now. Individuals that used to be able to afford their health care coverage, but now they cannot and no longer have health care anymore. The Affordable Care Act did cover a new group of people that were not covered before, but it also pushed out another whole group that used to have coverage that now does not. This is an extremely personal issue. This is not a political issue. These are families and lives and children. These are individuals that have cancer and diabetes and a history of genetic diseases in their family that they are very concerned about what happens politically in this room because it affects their families in their real life. Congress needs to act on this. What's happening right now in the status quo is untenable for families all across the country. Insurance carriers have left the market. Rates have gone up dramatically. We have fewer choices and more control but less control for families. What does that look like in my state? Well, in my state, premiums went up last year 76% last year. One year increase. I have folks all the time that say to me their great complaint about the rising cost of college tuition. Well, let me give you a glimpse. College tuition has increased 76% in 15 years. Insurance in my state went up 76% in one year. In fact, since Obamacare fully rolled out in 2013 to now, insurance in my state has gone up 201%. That's not the Affordable Care Act. That's a recipe to be able to push people out of insurance and to keep them out. Obamacare was designed to force healthy people to buy insurance to increase the risk pools for those insurance companies. But when you can't afford the premiums, you're forced to pay this big tax. Now the question is, who's paying the tax? Originally Obamacare said, well, people that didn't buy into the insurance, that wanted to just take their risk on their own, these wealthy individuals, they would have to pay the extra tax. Really? What did that end up looking like? Well, again, let me come back to my state. In my state, 96,000 Oklahomans are currently paying the tax to the IRS because they don't have the health care insurance. Who are they? 81% of the people that pay the penalty make less than $50,000 a year. These are individuals that cannot afford the insurance and they also can't afford the fine that's coming down the IRS. It is a poverty tax that the Affordable Care Act created to try to force these people into insurance they cannot afford, and when they can't afford that, then they get a big hit, hit on their taxes as well. It is literally a no-win situation for them. One of the major goals of the Affordable Care Act was to provide affordable coverage. It was to be able to help people get into insurance. It was to be able to help improve the safety net. Those are not irrational goals, those are good goals, but the execution of it was terrible. And the implementation has caused more problems than it solved. In my state, many physicians in rural areas used to be independent. Now they've all been forced into working for big hospitals because they can't afford the compliance cost to keep their office moving anymore. So independent doctors and independent clinics are now part of big conglomerate hospital companies. I'm glad those hospital companies are there. 
or we'd have no access to care at all. My state used to have four insurance carriers in the state. Now it has one, and that one is discussing leaving. I hear all the time people that are mad at Republicans saying, why haven't you solved this yet? Quite frankly, this is an incredibly difficult issue. But I also want to be able to respond back to people. Don't gripe at the firefighters fighting the wildfire. They didn't start it. We're trying to put it out. And yes, I know the fire line is big. And yes, I know it's difficult to be able to take out. But we're doing our best to be able to resolve a fire we did not start. But we will resolve this. So what's happening right now in this trying to resolve this? What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to do several specific things dealing with the Affordable Care Act. This is not about resolving everything in health care. There's lots of issues, quite frankly, lots of issues we have bipartisan agreement on that we should work on in the days ahead. Things like prescription drugs and so many other things that we can do to help bring down the cost of health care itself. But in the meantime, we do have a dispute. Our Democratic colleagues have said to us, they want to be able to cooperate with us on health care, but the parameters are we have to keep the individual mandate, that tax penalty on people in my state for people $50,000 or less to pay this giant tax. They want to keep that. They want to keep the employer mandate, which is dramatically driving up the cost of insurance for employers and decreasing wages. Uh, the initial estimates are the people in my state are making about $2,500 a year less now than they would be because of the employer mandate that's on them. So we can't negotiate to say, let's form a bipartisan agreement on this if they want to keep the individual mandate and want to keep the employer mandate. Those things hurt the people at home. So here's what we're trying to do. This is a budget bill. It's called reconciliation. We're limited to only budget-related items to, to be able to deal with. So we're working on some of the basics of what needs to be repealed in the Affordable Care Act. We do want to get rid of the individual mandate. We do want to get rid of the employer mandate. We do want to deal with how can we take control of health care out of Washington, D.C. and get it back to the states where it used to be. Prices were much cheaper when there was local control on health care than when there's federal centralized control. We'd also like to find a way to be able to get some of the bureaucracy out of this. You see, when there's a health care dollar paid and it first have to, has to pay the federal bureaucracy, then it goes to the state, has to pay the state bureaucracy, then it pays an insurance company bureaucracy, and then it pays a hospital bureaucracy. There's not much of that do dollar left to finally get to patient care at the end. If we can take out one of those bureaucracies, we can actually get more dollars to patients rather than having just feeding the bureaucracy of another layer. We're simply trying to deal with the mandates that are there, who actually makes the health care decisions for regulations and policy, whether it's the state or the federal government, and how are we going to balance out coverage for individuals that desperately need it in the safety net? Now, I've heard a lot of folks as well talking about CBO scores. I would tell you, I'm in the middle of the group that's very frustrated with CBO right now. Every policy we want to float to say this is something we think will be very effective to be able to help people in the safety net or to be able to help people purchase insurance, CBO responds back to us. That sounds like an interesting idea. It'll take us about four weeks to study it. Well, in a legislative process, when we're doing amendments, we can't wait four weeks between each amendment. We have to be able to get answers from them. So we're stuck in this spot. So our resolution is, we have a House version that has been scored. We have a Senate version. We have a lot of changes that we want to make even to our latest version. The best answer we have while we wait on CBO scoring another month to be able to get us an answer back is to be able to get an interim bill, get into a conference between the House and the Senate, allow CBO the month that they need to be able to score this, and then just be able to pass a better bill in September. So that's where we're stuck right now. So this is not a final bill that's coming out. This is still an interim process that's moving. But we need to be able to keep this process moving because there are people at home that are counting on this actually getting better for them in the future. Because their words to me are, this cannot get worse because I can't afford what we currently have and I can't afford that access that I've been given to healthcare. Now in the middle of all this debate that a lot of people on the outside look at it and say, how come the Senate can't move faster? And I respond back to them, well, we can't get a score from the CBO, so we can't move any faster. We're stuck waiting on them. They typically will call me and say, well, just run over CBO. Well, we're not going to ignore the law, and we're not going to ignore the rules of the Senate. But we are going to work to actually get this right. 
In the meantime, I've heard an awful lot of scare tactics coming out. It usually circles around, there'll be 22 million people that will suddenly not have insurance, which is a fascinating number to me, since only 9 million people have Obamacare right now. 9 million are actually on the exchanges. So it seems difficult for me for 22 million people to lose what only 9 million people have. But if you're an economist, they look at on the horizon people that may one day join in at some point, and then those people that may have joined in then might have lost their insurance. It makes total sense to an economist, but to all of us that just look at math, it becomes very difficult. CBO also believes that without a federal mandate and a tax penalty on individuals, they will not buy this insurance product. People do not want to buy it and will not buy it unless they're made to buy it. The problem is there's six and a half million people in the country that are also required to buy it, that they're just paying the tax rather than buying the insurance. We need to allow people to make decisions on their own life. But we need to also make sure there's actually an insurance product they can afford. And all the scare tactics about we're going to throw out pre-existing conditions and people that have pre-existing conditions will be on their own, it's not true. Every single one that we've debated have all included protection for pre-existing conditions. We all are still honoring things like lifetime caps, annual caps. We've all included 26 and under. If you want to be able to stay on your parents' insurance, you can still do that. There's been all these scare tactics about this will throw senior adults out on the street and Medicaid is going to have these dramatic cuts. I look at one of the proposals that was put out by the Senate in one of the drafts that we went through and I looked at it and said dramatic cuts. Here's the dramatic cuts in Medicaid that we had in it. Every year for the next eight years, Medicaid increased at twice the rate of inflation. Every year for eight years in a row, twice the, twice the rate of inflation, Medicaid went up. That is twice as fast as Medicare goes up. Twice as fast as Medicare. So Medicaid was accelerating twice as fast as Medicare. And then eight years from now, Medicaid went back to growing the same speed as Medicare at the rate of inflation. That was the dramatic cut in Medicaid. Every year going up twice as fast as inflation is a cut. Nine years from now, only growing as fast as inflation is a cut. But it's being portrayed that people are going to be thrown out on the streets and Medicaid is going away. I would encourage Americans to understand the conversation has been a lot about political rhetoric. This body really is committed to the safety net. This body really is committed to allowing people to have choices again they can actually afford in insurance. We are really committed to taking control of health care out of Washington, D.C. and pushing it back to the states and to families where they can control health care decisions again. That's the real debate that's happening here. And I know it's boisterous, and I know it's much easier just to have bumper sticker comments. But at the end of this, we have to realize there really are people that are involved in this, that are deeply affected by it. Mr. President, a couple more stories. A gentleman just recently sent me an email. He said he received word that his premiums are rising from $1,229 a month to $2,205 a month to cover just he and his wife. His deductible is rising to $4,000 a person. His out-of-pocket maximum is rising to $13,000. That's under Obamacare now. Another person that wrote me, currently under Obamacare now, says he's 62 years old and my wife is 61. Our monthly health insurance and premium increased by 71% to $2,900 last year. My wife and I are healthy with no major problems, so my health insurance is the size of my mortgage payment. That's under Obamacare now. Under Obamacare now. A lady from my state wrote me and said, my first year my monthly premium was $1,200. This year, I'll pay $1,900 a month. I just got a letter from the one insurance company left in my state, the one opportunity that she has to get insurance, that her monthly premium next year will be $3,540. That's an increase of 84%, or $42,000 a year for insurance under Obamacare now. 
her simple statement to me is, how is this possible? I speak to some of my colleagues and they say those stories aren't true. And I say, let me introduce you to some real life people that are outside of this political debate, that are debating around their kitchen table about how they're gonna make it with the rates that have been put on them. What we have now has to be addressed. And I know this is a boisterous, loud pro uh, process. But as we walk through the process, the end solution are for these families so that our noise helps them actually move back to thinking about their kids and what they're gonna do next in their retirement, not how in the world am I gonna pay for my health insurance anymore. Let's get this finished. Let's move to the next stage. Let's get to conference and try to resolve the differences between the House and the Senate. And by September, when we finally get a score back from CBO on all of our scoring, and they finally get us information on the things we've asked for, let's get this passed so we can actually get this done. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr.